Hello, it's Scott Manley here, sitting out on the San Francisco waterfront after, well, an interesting night. Uh, so yeah, no real video today because of that whole baseball thing that happened last night. The rest of the world probably doesn't care, but you know, hey, San Francisco home team, you know, it's a lot of fun. But a lot of people have been asking me what I think of the, the Antares launch failure on Tuesday. Now, uh, obviously there was a launch failure on Monday, which was comical because they had to abandon the launch because of a boat in the area. But uh, yeah, it wouldn't have mattered because Tuesday was vastly more spectacular. And with a spectacular event like that, lots of people are saying lots of things. There's all sorts of theories as to what might go on. There's lots of smart ass comments about their 40 year old Soviet built engines. So. Let's uh, actually just talk about those engines. Now, those engines are being used by Orbital Sciences. And I've got to point out, Orbital Sciences, right, they ha are a corporation that has been in the space launch industry for something like 30 years. They have a history of doing more with less. They, of course, uh, are the guys behind the Pegasus launcher. That's a light rocket that uses solid rocket motors and it launches from underneath an aircraft which of course puts it above a lot of the densest part of the atmosphere, gives a little bit of velocity, and of course it also means that you don't need a launch site. So they actually provide some of the cheapest access to orbit, and it's been a surprisingly uh, reliable launcher. Similarly, they also do the Minotaur, which is a, or it used to be the Taurus, now it's a Minotaur. It's a uh, solid rocket booster-based system where they take a Pegasus rocket, and uh, sit on top of an old ICBM, and that's another launch uh, system that they run. They've had a few failures on that, but point is, you know, they're repurposing old hardware. So with Antares, the fact that they're using these old Russian engines isn't actually that surprising, and it's even less surprising when you realize that on paper, these were some of the best rocket engines ever built. They, uh, at the time, and even till recently, they are the most efficient and the best fuel in terms of, uh, the most efficient in terms of specific impulse. And they had the highest thrust to weight ratio until Merlin on the SpaceX Falcon came along. And even then, they're much more efficient than the SpaceX engines. So, you know, they, they can hold their uh, head high and with pride. These are amazing pieces of technology and they were literally built 40 years ago. Now, you probably heard that the Soviets and the, and the Americans, they had this moon race in the 60s. And uh, the Russians, they built this giant rocket called the N1. It was powered by something like 30 first stage engines. The Russians didn't go for scaling up their existing engines like uh, the Americans, they just built more of them. Uh, Interesting thing, there's this odd perception uh, when people write about the Soviet versus the American space program that the American space program somehow had more finesse. That The Russians just built things like trains and put rockets on them. They were built big and made of steel and very heavy. And actually, when it, at least when it comes to engines, the reverse is true. The Russian engines turned out to be much more efficient. They built, you know, smaller more efficient, more powerful engines. Americans just built these huge F1 engines, which they had to test them dozens and dozens of times before they finally figured out the thrust plate configuration, or the, the fuel plate configuration that didn't make them explode on the launch pad. Whereas the Russians took their existing engine and refined it and you got something amazing. And you know, despite all the comments of you know, Soviet engine technology exploding, uh, since Tuesday, there have been two other launches powered by essentially Soviet, you know, Russian designed engines. We've had a, a Soyuz Proton launch, and then we've had a, an Atlas V, which is of course powered by the RD-180 engines, similarly d derived from uh, Soviet designs. Anyway, yeah, the N1 needed 30 of these engines, and for some reason, they went to a different design bureau than the group that had designed the engines for the original launchers, right? They went to the Kuntsov, Kuntsov, I, I'm probably, I'm gonna mispronounce this horrifically. Now, uh, this team had had great success building aircraft engines. They built some of the best plane engines in the world. And so when they built a rocket engine, it wasn't entirely unsurprising that on paper, it was the best rocket engine in the world. Uh, unfortunately, when you have 30 of them, the odds of one of them exploding is pretty high. And so 
you know, in computers, right, we have redundancy, right? When we're running servers, we have, you know, duplicate everything. So if one server crashes, we can switch over to the other one. In rocket science, that doesn't always work so well because when one engine goes down, it typically is with a rather violent and explosive style. So it not only takes down the engine, but it will possibly take down its neighbors, which can then, you know, propagate. Generally, I mean, you've seen the Falcon 9 where one engine exploded and the rocket kept going. That is, that is an ideal situation. And it's obviously uh, technology has been developed well by uh, SpaceX to make this happen. But um, yeah, N1, when you've got 30 engines, one of them explodes, the whole thing goes down. They had four launch failures. They had took what they had learned in terms of engine design and they had produced a better design, fixing a number of the flaws. And they were all ready to keep on going with this N N1 Soviet program and then it was ordered killed. So these engines that they had built, they were called, I think the NK-33s was what they, they were officially designated as. They, they were ordered destroyed essentially by the Kremlin, but someone was smart enough to say this is a bad idea. They took the engines and they hit them off in a warehouse somewhere and it wasn't until like 30 years later that they uh, were found. Uh, maybe less than that. Basically after the Cold War ended, the Soviet rocket scientists started talking to NASA and the, the space engineers out here, the rocket scientists out here, were literally, they kept on asking for corrections because they were hearing uh, you know, specific impulses and thrust to weight ratios, which they thought were impossible. <laughs> the Soviets were well ahead of, of uh, American engineers. You know, they, um, what, what are they, they used these stage combustion cycles, which were oxygen rich. Uh, they basically had more oxygen in the initial turbo pump cycle because it, they had to cool the bearings and liquid oxygen is cooler than liquid kerosene. So um, they, they had to have this very rich fuel mixture. And of course, with uh, that kind of super hot gas, it's very likely that you're gonna burn through your metallic parts. But, uh, and, and so the American space program kind of dismissed this as being too difficult. But, you know, Russians went on ahead and they developed the metallurgy that let them build these, uh, these turbines and these impellers that were able to pump the fuel and run off this fuel mixture and then feed the whole lot into the main combustion chamber and get great efficiencies and thrust to weight ratios. Anyway, where was I? Yes, uh, Cold War ends, uh, these engines turn up. Um, now, there's one set of engines get kind of derived from this, that becomes the RD-180, which uh, goes on the Atlas. Whereas uh, Orbital Sciences, they, they essentially take these NK-33 engines and they ask Aerojet to refurbish them. And of course, what they do to refurbish them is they take them apart, they fix all the welds, they use, you know, tomography, you know, uh, particles, whatever. They basically look inside and they find all the ones that have good solid metal without any creep or cracks or any aging and uh, make sure that they're going to be solid. They replace all the electronics with modern hardware and then they sell them as new engines which are still fantastic performing engines and of course they tested them a whole lot before they started building rockets with them and the Antares had had a great record until this point it had four successful launches so that was better than SpaceX which had had a couple of you know launch failures up to this point so such a spectacular launch failure so close to the ground obviously asks a lot of questions, but at the same time, uh, it's not entirely unexpected that you would have a launch failure like this. I mean, it doesn't matter that it was close to the ground and spectacular and exploding, because if you fail you know, a thousand miles down range and nobody sees it, it's still a failure. Of course, being so close to the ground, there's a lot of speculation that goes out. Uh, I've, ha I've already seen really interesting conspiracy theories centered on the fact that seconds after launch, or just after the explosion, it, which we don't know was the engine, incidentally, it, could, it was just in the vicinity of the engine. It could be something else. It could have been plumbing, could have been, I don't know, could have been anything in the vicinity down there. That's where all the action's going on, so it's quite common to see the, uh, a failure start in that location. I've, I've seen people, anyway, 
commenting that straight after the explosion there were still people in mission control calling out status is nominal and this was pointing to some sort of grand conspiracy and oh yeah they closed down the launch site because of potential cryptographic equipment and stuff on the ground um yeah when you're launching a spacecraft and its engine explodes it's entirely unlikely it's entirely likely that the electrical system will still show nominal power levels and your attitude control may still show that the rocket is pointed perfectly straight up and down but may not know that it is in fact sliding backwards into the ground <laughs> so yeah that that is just that's a red herring don't worry about that people also note that there were little puffs of smoke coming out at the top of the stage and it seemed to kind of turn over straight after launch that is perfectly normal when you launch a rocket, you immediately make it turn over a little so that if it explodes, say, 10 seconds into launch, it doesn't fall right back down on top of the launch site. And you'll see the photos of the damaged launch site. Uh, the rocket, most of the rocket did, in fact, land towards the sea and the fuel tanks and everything that were on the ground are mostly intact. So they'll be able to refurbish that. It's not going to be the most expensive uh, repair but it is expensive because in terms of reputation that it has affected the stock price of a company which has had a regular launch cycle for years and years i think they lost something like 20 16 to 20 percent of their stock value i expect they'll gain that back once they you know, look into this and they also will continue trying to source new engines for their antares launch vehicle i mean you'll note that uh, the atlas is also going through a similar problem because of the um let's say, political issues with uh, the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, the Atlas program may not be able to continue to acquire their engines from Russia, and so they are, of course, looking for new engines as well. And I, I hear that Jeff Bezos, uh, their Blue Origin company, may in fact have an engine, because that's what Boeing is talking about using in their space launch system. But uh, I'm not really 100% clear on what's going on there, so... Yeah, that's what's going on with the Antares, at least in my head. And I hope you've I hope I've answered a bunch of questions and feel free to comment on this. Oh and yeah, um yeah, if you weren't a Giants fan, if you're a Royals fan, I'm sorry, I hope you have a great 2015 season. Till then, fly safe.